Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Anders Osland, who is a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute in Washington, D.C. His new book is Russia's Capitalist Revolution. Dr. Osland, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Where were you born and raised? I was born in the Katskog, a small industrial town in Sweden. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, uh, they had uh, pretty clear ideas of uh, the importance of uh, freedom, democracy, and market economy. And was there a discussion, uh, a great interest around the dinner table about the Soviet Union or about international politics? Yeah, something quite important was that uh, my mother, who was a dentist, had uh, a colleague who was from Latvia. So I learned about uh, the repression of the Baltic people uh, at the end of the Second World War uh, very much uh, firsthand uh, as a child from uh, this uh, dear colleague of my mother. And, and living in Sweden, growing up in Sweden, were, were, was there a greater sense of this forbidding presence of the Soviet Union so close? Sure. Sweden always had a pretty strong defense because it was neutral and because the Soviet Union was so close. So there was always a sense that there was a threat. Yes. And uh, what did you major in as an undergraduate and then in your graduate studies and where did you get your degrees? I uh, had uh, my main degree in economics from the Stockholm School of Economics. Then I had another degree in uh, Russian Polish history uh, from uh, 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 Stockholm University. And I've uh, done my doctorate uh, at Oxford. And what was your doctorate on? Private enterprise in Poland and East Germany. Mm -hmm. uh, why did the private sector survive and uh, uh, how did it function? Mm -hmm. And uh, when did you enter your, complete your degree, begin your, uh, your formal role as a professor in relation to the history of the Soviet Union? What year would that have been? Well, you can say that I've worked on uh, Russia ever since 1972 when I started uh, doing Russia, actually at Uppsala University in Sweden. And uh, I traveled to Russia the first time, or the Soviet Union, in 1972. Uh, Go ahead, please. Go ahead. And of course, to go to the Soviet Union then was a shock. Mm -hmm. It and was a, a, a terrible third world uh, place. It was not only third world, but it was cold, dirty, dark. And, and what, uh, it, once you had your economics training, what impressed you the most? I mean, was it the, the stagnation and decay of the economy, the, the failure of the economy, or was it more kind of the, the, the lack of, of political freedom? Well, uh, something different. I'm generally interested in political and economic systems. And you can say that uh, the Soviet Union, it was uh, quite uh, different as an uh, economic system but culturally it was not uh, so far away. So mm -hmm. it was uh, quite comprehensible at one level. At the other level, it was just closed. Uh, students watch this program in, in addition to the general public, and so the, I want to talk a little about what skills are required to do what you do. What, what is the best training? It sounds like you have to know everything from math to Russian to comparative history. <laughs> Yeah, I think that uh, this is uh, the kind of uh, studies that I specialize on, where it's more eclectic, that you need a bit of everything and not uh, going deeply into mathematical models or uh, such, uh, such things. So I do uh, where you have more uh, use of uh, many different kinds of knowledge. Mm -hmm. A bit of politics, a bit of economics, uh, quite a bit of history, and also languages. And it would seem that it, you need all of those together because the, 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 it seems like uh, you, you can really under, uh, misunderstand things if you're just looking at the economics. 
Indeed. I think this was the, the big mistake for a long time when uh, US uh, knowledge about the Soviet Union was dominated by CIA people who never visited the Soviet Union because the analysts, they stay home. It was the, the daring agents that were out on the uh, spot and they were, of course, uh, not contributing to the analysis. Your, your book uh, is subtitled Why Market Reform Succeeded and Why Democracy failed. And so I want to walk you through, uh, you know, the main points. And, and uh, let's talk, first of all, about the situation during the Gorbachev period. I mean, it, 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 because your, your analysis requires looking at various things, and one is this question of Gorbachev and his inability to reform the system. Talk a little about that. Uh, because we in the West thought he would be able to do more than he wound up doing, although he did a lot. Yeah, I think that the fundamental problem was that uh, uh, the Soviet Union was deep frozen. It was totally petrified. So there was a change uh, both at the top and at the bottom, but nothing could ever change. And uh, then Gorbachev and a few of his colleagues thought that this is not good enough. We can change, we have to change. And first they tried with some uh, economic reforms and they realized that nothing happened because everything was sabotaged by the, uh, the overwhelming bureaucracy that was really the true dictator in the Soviet Union. And uh, they did what they wanted. I'll give you one example. Mm -hmm. Uh, one month after Gorbachev had uh, uh, come to power, I was uh, working at the Swedish embassy then. I went up to see um, uh, a top official at the Soviet Minister of Agriculture. And I asked him what one of the first decrees about agriculture reform that had been issued by Gorbachev actually meant. And this senior official said, why it doesn't mean a damned thing. Mm. Why should I bother about a decree signed by the Secretary General of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union? He's not my boss. I work at the Ministry of Agriculture. Mm. So I thought that this was uh, one of these old uh, folkies who would uh, soon lose out. Nothing mm. of the sort. He just advanced. So the point was that the bureaucrats felt secure. They could attack even the Secretary General of the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. But in some areas, uh, uh, Gorbachev did a great service, for example, in foreign policy, because he made it possible for the Soviet empire to end. Uh, uh, he, he set the conditions for that happening. Yeah, and you can also say that he saw that there were some there was some low-hanging fruit to be picked up in foreign policy. So his most successful period in foreign policy was really the first two years or so, uh, when he managed to get the uh, uh, INF uh, treaty with uh, the US, uh, the, that is the treaty on uh, intermediary nuclear forces in Europe. And this was a very important uh, a breakthrough in 1987. And of course, uh, Gorbachev's uh, personal uh, very high standing and the very good relations that he developed with virtually uh, all uh, countries. But uh, partly I think that uh, it was because he enjoyed it, but most of all because he saw this as a lever to do the much more difficult changes that were needed at home. Mm -hmm. and, and in a way, his failure uh, over and above his skills, his skill set, which I think you're suggesting was not as good as Yeltsin in, in, in some respects, uh, that, that his failure was that he saw himself as a reformer and the system could not be reformed. Indeed. Uh, his ultimate failure was that he thought that uh, communists could be reformed and it could only be destroyed. On the other hand, if Gorbachev hadn't uh, tried to reform it, it would not have go gone away as pe uh, peacefully as it did. So uh, he did a great service, but his uh, service was based on his misunderstanding, and he doesn't seem to uh, understand it even today. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a theme that runs through your book, which we're going to touch on right now, and then we're going to pick it up again, and that is the role of external actors. Uh, and, and it's very important to the foreign policy debate here whether the Reagan policies 
uh, with regard to Star Wars, the, the, the defense challenge, pushed the Soviet Union off the cliff. Uh, what is your take on that? Is it a contributing factor, or there were too many internal contradictions, so this would have happened anyway? The outside world was important, and of course, Star Wars was an important part of it. But I think the fundamental issue was that uh, uh, Gorbachev uh, and his allies they felt that uh, the Soviet Union was falling uh, ever more behind, and something had uh, to, to be done. So I think it would be wrong to pick one specific uh, uh, issue. But uh, you can say that uh, the Star Wars idea was very much a wake-up call. Now, uh, as a comparativist, somebody who looks at different economic and political situations to understand the course that revolution takes, there, there, there is a tendency to, to want to equate what's happening in Russia uh, with what, hap what happened in China. Let's talk about that, namely the, the introduction. How does one, why, why are the two cases so very different, which is an argument you make in the book? Well, they are very different for many reasons. You can say that uh, China started in a crisis situation. Uh, Deng Xiaoping came in when everybody uh, thought that something must be done differently. Gorbachev came in at a time when uh, everybody thought, uh, almost thought, that nothing must change. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, in the, uh, the Soviet Union, the uh, officials didn't obey. In mm -hmm. uh, China, they were uh, still afraid and they obeyed because they uh, were not uh, uh, as firmly in charge as they were in the, in the, the Soviet uh, Union. And uh, even today, China's GDP per capita is one quarter of Russia's mm -hmm. in current dollars. So China is a much simpler and uh, a poorer uh, economy than you can uh, uh, go about it in the different ways. And part of that was that uh, three quarters of the Chinese worked in ag agriculture mm. uh, to compare with one quarter in the, in the Soviet Union or less. So uh, they were totally different. In China, you could uh, leave the state uh, owned industry aside. In the Soviet Union, you had to hit the industry hard because that was more than 50 percent of the economy. In China, you had manual labor and um, uh, actual entities of production were relatively small. In the Soviet Union, you could hardly find a cow shed without 400 cows. Everything was large scale in the Soviet hmm. Union, so you had to break it up. And that uh, made it so much more difficult uh, to reform in the Soviet Union. Also, uh, Soviet products uh, uh, in the manufacturing were awful. Living in Moscow in 1985, uh, you could buy only a few things that were available and of Western quality. Salt, mineral water, vodka, bread, hardly anything else. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and uh, all these are the products that were produced. If it were, was uh, uh, cars or if it was household machinery uh, or clothes, it was useless. Hmm. And uh, uh, while in China they didn't produce all that much uh, at that time when the reforms uh, started. Mm -hmm. uh, before we talk about the revolution and, and how the, 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 the levers of power were seized, uh, to make the economic reform possible. I, I want to ask you, because you had this unique opportunity to be both an observer, analyst, but also a participant, and not just by your many visits, but you actually, at a critical point, w were, you were advising the, the, the then Russian government. Talk a little about that. I mean, d does, your, does your, uh, your work as a scholar greatly enhance your insights, so uh, and and do those insights have important policy implications? Uh, I think it is quite important to see how things are actually being done, and in particular what you can do and what you can't do. Uh, for example, if you see the Prime Minister of Russia, mm -hmm. and you are acting as a policy advisor, not as a, a foreign dignitary, then you don't take more than 15 minutes of his time. Mm -hmm. You have a clear message, you want to get it through, and you want to get more meetings. Mm 
So then you have to be focused, sharp, clear. There's mm -hmm. no time for um, a lot of nuances, uh, certainly not exceptions. You have to have a policy message and you must have strong arguments for it so that you can uh, convince the, uh, the, the policy maker. And, uh, of course, it's important also to see how the government operates, uh, simply how the mechanism of a government function, what works and what uh, doesn't work, and that's uh, often quite surprising. For example, in Russia, on the one hand, things are very formal. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, many of these formalities, but not all, can be thrown overboard in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. it, it, and you have your feet in both the, in terms of your scholarship, in both the economic realm and the political realm. And I, before we talk about the differences in the revolutions, is there a difference that you would make as an analytical observer between politics and economics, you know, and economic policy and uh, uh, the, the policies related to political reform? Well, uh, I, I would uh, emphasize that uh, the economists are more keen on being involved in a a actual economic policy. Mm -hmm. You can say that there's more demand for economists in uh, uh, government jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, while it's more uncommon that political scientists go for uh, uh, political jobs. And is that Outside of foreign policy. Mm -hmm. is, is that because uh, 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 economists have better theories? No, I would say it's because uh, there are simply more functions of government that requires economies, as simple as that. Okay. So what we have in this period of the end of Gorbachev and then the rise of Yeltsin is a revolutionary situation. What, talk a little more about it. You touched on it, but, but what <clears throat> made it really revolutionary upon which uh, a good leader could, could take action? Well, uh, you can say that uh, a revolution is when uh, the constitutional order ceases to function mm -hmm. and when uh, uh, you go beyond uh, the roads. Some people uh, uh, argue that there must be violence. I would argue that it's not uh, part of it. So the fundamental issue is that the institutions cease to, uh, to function. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means two things. On the one hand, it uh, means that very little can be done by the state. There is no state capacity. Um, typically, the, the bureaucrats are just sitting and rolling their thumbs and are, are not working. And the other uh, issue is that uh, nobody stands up if the top policy makers are making fundamentally new decisions. So mm -hmm. this is a time when you can think, think big but mm -hmm. you can't think small. Mm -hmm. You can't do the small things. You can't improve the healthcare system, but you can change the constitution. Mm -hmm. And the, the situation was truly revolutionary because the, the Soviet empire collapsed. The, the, the regions, the provinces were not submitting money to the treasury. So there was a real opportunity and it was seized uh, by Yeltsin. You, you enumerate uh, the, the the elements of what a leader, a true leader in a revolutionary situation should do. And you believe that a lot of this happened between October uh, uh, 91 and January 92 under Yeltsin's presidency. Let me just enumerate uh, these items that you mention in your book. Your ideas must be clear, simple, and relevant. The ideas must be translated into a set of policy actions. Political leader must take the lead and make authoritative policy declarations. The leader needs to appoint a group of policymakers who can execute the reforms. You must have parliamentary support, and a, there is a brief window of opportunity for extraordinary politics. Yeltsin saw that and acted in a way, uh, in, in most instances, along these lines. Is that? That's what yeah, very, very much so. And you can see it particularly in the second uh, part of his memoirs, uh, where he discusses the events as a, as a revolution. He saw what uh, uh, he thought was truly important, and he emphasizes two things, to dissolve the Soviet Union and to undertake um, market economic reform. What he did not understand 
was what to do about uh, the political system because he thought uh, that the political system somehow worked. He wanted to have a new constitution, but that was not his uh, a prime issue. And, and so let's look first at the economic revolution. What, what are the thing? Walk us through <clears throat> briefly the steps that were taken, and and the goal is very clear: a market economy, mm. and there are clear indicators of what that goal is like when you reach that point. Yeah. So um, um, it was very much an idea that we have to do it now. If we don't do it now, we'll fall into a t complete chaos and uh, we don't know uh, what will happen. The danger of civil war was always in the, in the, in the background and the economy was uh, truly collapsing. And the idea was also not to do something that was original, but to do something that was standard. Mm -hmm. And a standard market economy, you can say, rests on three pillars. Free trade and prices, that's the first. Uh, the second is uh, privatization. Uh, you need the predominance of private property. And the third is uh, reasonably stable uh, prices uh, to get uh, the state finances and monetary policy uh, under control so that the inflation is limited. Mm -hmm. and, and these were all done in this environment, but uh, what about the reactions you get when you do this? I mean, if you had had a different leader, because as the, the, you have chaos, you have a, a kind of a breakdown of institutions, but the, 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 the consequences of what you're doing as policy is unclear at the time, correct? I mean, you don't know if the, well, you know the theory tells you it'll work, but that's different than convincing people that it will work. Yeah, and uh, of course there are many uh, problems and uh, shortcomings. Uh, the first is that uh, the old elite knows different things. They know a socialist economy and they think that this is wrong. They say that this is unprofessional. And they put forward all their outstanding economists. So uh, the only problem was that it was the wrong uh, economics uh, mm -hmm. that they uh, knew. So that's part of it. And then you have all the uh, uh, politicians who have come up uh, in one way or the other in the revolutionary chaos. And they think that they should have a top jobs because they did the revolution. And now instead, uh, there are people who know economics who are getting uh, the, the top economic jobs, which uh, makes them uh, very upset. And then you have a lot of operators who utilize the chaos to make money for themselves. Mm -hmm. That uh, actually turned out to be the biggest uh, uh, danger. But eventually all these forces uh, 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 colluded and uh, uh, caused a lot of trouble. The, the, what one has the sense as you read through your book that there is really a, 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 uh, an evolution of the, the uh, economic groups that rise and fall. We begin with the insiders who benefit, you move to the oligarchs and so on, but, but for whatever reasons there was a resiliency within the Soviet Union so there was movement forward. How did, how did that happen? I mean, one would think that at any one point one of these groups would have stopped the revolution in its tracks. Yeah, and uh, also, uh, uh, let me take one thing. I uh, spent uh, a lot of time in December 91 in Moscow, and uh, I walked around, and uh, the people had a sense that a sword of Damocles was uh, hanging over them, and uh, that a, a, a terrible catastrophe uh, would come over them. So they were all of a sudden very kind. Mm. The Moscovites are normally not very kind, mm. but they were kinder than ever before because they felt that there was a great uh, a danger uh, hanging uh, over them. And uh, the strange thing was that everybody continued to go to their jobs. Mm. Uh, soon enough, they didn't get salaries, but they continued to go to their jobs anyhow, and they didn't really work. But uh, th there was an amazing social calm, mm -hmm. which, uh, of course, the authorities uh, uh, tried uh, 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 to ma maintain. But uh, this was the backdrop. So while the events were very dramatic, uh, 
Mm -hmm. On the surface, it was surprisingly calm. Uh, after um, 1990, there were no mass demonstrations. Uh, it was a social demobilization. When the prices were liberalized, nobody took to the street. Mm -hmm. It was the same in Russia as everywhere else. Uh, if you liberalize the prices, you change the paradigm. People understand that it's something new. They're worried, but they don't take to the streets. And is this because under the Soviet system they had become passive? Is it something with historical roots in, in, in Russian uh, character and culture? No, on the contrary, this is the dynamics of uh, the revolution. I see. In uh, February uh, 1990, uh, Moscow saw the biggest demonstrations. Uh, the liberals, the Democrats had uh, 500,000 people out in demonstrations a couple of times. And their opponents, the hardline communists, had 300,000 people out in demonstrations in February, March uh, 1990. That was the time when people were mobilized. Mm -hmm. But when things were getting more complicated, most people felt that they didn't know what and therefore they became demobilized. And this is typical of a revolutionary situation that uh, in the midst of a revolution, people get demobilized. Mm -hmm. uh, let's go back now to this theme about external intervention. We, we talked about it earlier with regard to the fall of communism. Uh, what kind of grade do you give the West and the United States during this very important period of the implementation uh, of uh, the, the, the economic revolution? Uh, were we intervening at the right time or not? Did we, we provide the critical aid and advice when it was needed? The West didn't do anything at all. Mm -hmm. There were visits, yes, but there was no concrete aid. During the first year of radical uh, market reforms in Russia, the West didn't help in any way at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was clearly a U.S. policy. George Bush, who was president at the time, uh, thought that it was not popular uh, to provide uh, 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 financial support um, uh, to the outside world. If you take the desert war uh, that uh, took place at the same time, it was entirely financed uh, with uh, contributions from other countries, mainly from Saudi Arabia, that uh, Jim Baker, then the Secretary of State, uh, uh, traveled around the world in order to, uh, uh, to collect. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was very much Bush who said, no, we don't do this. And another was that it, they didn't want to talk uh, uh, to, to the Russians and uh, suggest that. Uh, in Washington, the dominant interest was the uh, uh, Treasury that said, we want our money back. Mm -hmm. We want the Soviet debt to be serviced. It was uh, serviced. And uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, the Soviet Union has paid back more on its old communist debt than has been given in uh, Western aid. Mm -hmm. So and this is uh, in the height of uh, a systemic change uh, in the early uh, 90s. So the West simply took a back seat and it's in the early stage that you can really do something. And also this was when the economic crisis was at the worst and the West only provided some uh, humanitarian assistance that didn't help the reforms at all. Mm -hmm. Now, Yeltsin really made a difference, and, and I think that your discussion of him, although you, you fault him on some things, and we'll talk about the, the political failures in a minute, but in terms of the, the, uh, the economics, he followed your criteria. And uh, so I guess the, the question uh, is, what made the qualities of leadership uh, uh, in him. W what was it about him that led him to act <clears throat> according to, 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 to address the problems of this revolutionary situation? And then what does that tell us about the, the importance of an individual, a personality, in changing the course of history? Uh, of course, uh, Yeltsin was very intelligent, and he was uh, uh, very well read. The last time I met him, uh, which was uh, in 2004, 
uh, I asked him what he was doing and he said, I'm reading uh, one book a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, in particular he read history. So mm -hmm. he knew, for example, the Russian Revolution of 1917 extremely well himself. And uh, Yeltsin was one of these rare people who was at the same time in, uh, intelligent and intuitive. He just felt what was the right thing to do. Nobody could really understand how he reached that because uh, Yeltsin was by and large a man of few words. He didn't uh, present his argument. He said, this is this you. Then he listened to people who discussed and then he came to the conclusions, so, uh, which always confused uh, people. But he was one of these true, few true heroes, a man who stood up drew the conclusion, took uh, the lead himself, and had an enormous uh, civil and physical uh, courage. And uh, he was a very jovial, ple pleasant uh, uh, person. By character, obviously, I mean, a depressive uh, character. Not that he was sick, but that he was sometimes very manic and sometimes uh, uh, very depressed, which I think is typical for these outstanding mm -hmm. heroes. So he was at his height when the crisis was really severe. Whenever there was a severe crisis, Yeltsin tended to wake up and come to, to his own, and then he was absolutely unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he had an enormous uh, uh, psychological strength. And that's why he could draw these uh, radical con uh, conclusions and uh, carry it out. And uh, of course, in the early 90s, he was enormously charismatic. And, and that's what I was just going to ask you about. So he, wa he was uh, a populist. Uh, attuned to where the people would be if, if there was actually a, a functioning democracy in, in Russia? I wouldn't say populist. He yeah. was a popular leader. Yeah. He, uh, he was one of these uh, people who could go out and look at the crowd mm -hmm. and feel them and work them, mm -hmm. uh, them up. Uh, there was a, a kind of uh, ability that uh, Bill Clinton or uh, Mike Huckabee have. So he had a, a tremendous political skill. Give him a crowd, and he will uh, will take the lead. Mm -hmm. And and was it were all of these characteristics, in addition to to seeing the way to go, very important in in bringing it all together so the reforms happened? Yeah. Uh, Yeltsin was, of course, uh, uh, crucial. Without uh, Yeltsin, I think that Russia would have ended up in a, a complete chaos. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, there was uh, nobody but Yeltsin. Mm -hmm. He was the only uh, plausible uh, uh, leader. And of course, uh, Yeltsin was very Russian. Uh, in, in so many ways, but he was also intelligent and then he had this uh, intuitive uh, skill of using uh, uh, his uh, intelligence uh, and of course uh, he loved elections. Mm -hmm. uh, whenever there was an election he knew how to campaign mm -hmm. and uh, he, he won time and time again, March 90, uh, March 91, sorry, March 89 and uh, uh, also the presidential elections in uh, June 91. And uh, when he was quite ill, still in 96, uh, when he decided to run for president, uh, he started from 3% popularity rating and uh, he won uh, a reasonably honest uh, election. Mm -hmm. Now, when you give out the grades uh, on political reform in the Soviet uh, Union, the marks are not high. And where did Yeltsin and the, go wrong <clears throat> in terms of implementing democratic uh, reform? Well, uh, the fundamental mistake was in uh, August 91, and it's easy to understand uh, Yeltsin at the time. He prohibited the Communist Party. That was the real revolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, he thought that was essentially what needed to be done. He had a parliament. He had uh, just been elected democratically Russian president. So that institution was there. And uh, there was a Soviet uh, Russian constitution that could easily be amended so that one could uh, uh, get it reasonably right. But um, 
the problem was that uh, this constitution and the parliament that had been elected one and a half years before was not democratically elected. So it didn't really represent anything. So therefore, uh, Yeltsin soon realized that uh, the parliament uh, uh, turned against him after a little bit more than uh, half a year, never to come back again. So what he should have done is dissolve the parliament. Mm -hmm. It was clearly not uh, no particular constitutional ground for it. But at that time, uh, Yeltsin could do absolutely everything. The parliament would have voted with acclamation mm -hmm. for its own uh, dissolution if uh, Yeltsin had asked for it. But Yeltsin's sense was the parliament works, the political system works, so I need to concentrate on these two other issues, dissolution of the Soviet Union and the economic crisis. I can't do everything at once. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the kinds of things that didn't develop were a successful multi-party system as a result of this. Uh, uh, a new parliament might have been a place where that could happen. Indeed. So what was needed was uh, essentially proportional elections with a threshold for representation that uh, all the successful East uh, Central European democracies have done, early founding elections that mm -hmm. would uh, strengthen uh, the parties and also that uh, the parliament was relied upon to do legislation. Mm -hmm. uh, another foolhardy thing Yeltsin did in that regard was that he asked for one year's right to rule by decree so that he could uh, take very many, not all decisions, by decree. And as a consequence, these decrees were not well founded. Mm -hmm. And the parliament didn't have any meaningful uh, occupation, so therefore it started doing things that were uh, outright harmful. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen Fish, who's on the faculty here, you cite him as, as, looking, as saying too much oil, too little economic liberalization, and too weak a national legislature. Do you agree with those points as adding <clears throat> to the mix here in, in creating the situation where there isn't takeoff in, in the democratic revolution? Yeah, well, at that time, it was only the weak legislator that was a, yeah. a problem. Uh, later on, we have uh, too much oil. In the 1990s, the oil price was so low, so that was not much mm -hmm. of a concern. Mm -hmm. did, 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 was it inevitable that, that uh, Yeltsin's mistakes with regard to reform uh, paved the way for a Putin, if not the Putin? No. I think that the selection of uh, Putin was uh, uh, quite accidental. And it's not at all clear how much uh, Yeltsin was really involved in it himself. Mm -hmm. So it was a coterie of uh, uh, close advisors to Yeltsin who pushed for Putin. And Putin accepted, uh, uh, Yeltsin accepted uh, Putin. It was not uh, Yeltsin's uh, uh, proposal. And, um, uh, the fundamental mistake here that uh, Yeltsin did was that he did not dissolve uh, the KGB uh, fully. He uh, divided it and weakened the KGB. But what has happened now is that uh, the old KGB has largely come together again. Mm -hmm. So we are left, uh, after your, your tour de force here, of an analysis of both these uh, uh, revolutions, one that succeeded and one didn't, uh, we're, we're left with a con contradiction, which is a market economy has been put in place by mm. all objective measures, but uh, democracy and a, a democratic reform has not taken hold. And can the Soviet economy move forward unless there is an adjustment with regard uh, to uh, democratic uh, implementing the democratic revolution? Well, uh, as I see it, uh, Russia is uh, now one of the richest countries in the world. That is uh, not a democracy. The other countries uh, up there are uh, seven uh, oil countries, small uh, ones, uh, and Singapore, and possibly Malaysia. Otherwise, uh, all countries that are this uh, wealthy Mm -hmm. uh, are democracies. So this is uh, an anomaly. So from this grouping, we immediately see that uh, it's easy in small 
and uh, oil dominated countries uh, to maintain a dictatorship. But Russia is not small. Russia mm. is a big country. So uh, I think that uh, whenever the oil price uh, just moderates a little bit, we will see that uh, the regime collapses. And one reason is that the dominant uh, concern in all East uh, Central European uh, democracies is corruption. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the incumbent government almost always loses an election in uh, these new post-communist uh, uh, democracies. And Russia has a bit more corruption than they. So I think that uh, uh, when the oil revenues dry up ever so little, there will be a sharp reaction against the corruption, which is uh, truly outrageous in Russia today. In, in the meantime, ha talk a little about how uh, Putin has moved to consolidate his power and authoritarianism in the system. Uh, Putin has done this very systematically. What he did immediately was that he hit on uh, the big media oligarchs that controlled uh, uh, the big television channels and brought them under state uh, uh, control. And uh, what he also did immediately was that he uh, uh, brought the regional governors under state, uh, state control. And uh, then he has uh, uh, taken virtually all power out of uh, uh, the parliaments. He has systematically manipulated elections at all levels. Russia has a lot of, or had a lot of elections all the time, uh, as regional elections were held uh, at various times. And they became ever more manipulated. Uh, leading candidates were uh, nullified for no sensible reason uh, in the last uh, uh, minute. Uh, businessmen were told not to provide money for uh, candidates that were not uh, supported by uh, the government, uh, etc. And eventually, in 2005, uh, Putin managed to make the governors appointed. So now Russia has a Senate that is appointed, governors are appointed, uh, Duma that is totally man manipulated uh, by the uh, uh, government uh, or the Kremlin. And uh, <clears throat> the government itself uh, is not very important. So Putin really rules through the presidential administration and through uh, the, the various uh, secret po police uh, uh, services and uh, media are uh, strictly controlled, uh, non-governmental organizations are strictly controlled, have to be licensed. Uh, so if they really carry out uh, the prohibition of non-licensed, uh, 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 non-governmental organizations, uh, three quarters of them will, uh, will have to close down. And uh, financing is controlled by all kinds of uh, means, mainly illegal and uh, foreign interaction uh, with um, independent sect uh, sector is uh, being brought to, to a halt. So it's a very systematic uh, authoritarian role, but not very hard. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, there are some political prisoners, but not many. And there are a number of killings, but not many. Mm -hmm. Does he remain popular amidst all of these changes? And uh, if he does, is that because of the oil money, which might pass <clears throat> when the price goes down? Well, the question here is, what is popularity? When uh, media uh, are controlled and present him as a great hero who does everything for the people and no negative uh, uh, publicity about Putin is allowed on main media. You can find it on the internet and in uh, serious books, etc. Uh, and uh, then Putin also controls uh, most of the opinion poll organizations. So uh, what does the popularity uh, hmm. mean? If I were asked in uh, uh, Russia today if I uh, support uh, Putin, I would say I love him because you presume that uh, people who work with opinion poll organization work for the secret police also. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is no reason to pay any attention uh, to uh, what opinion polls uh, say about uh, such sensitive issues, mm -hmm. nor do we know if they are really uh, true 
uh, as with regard to the last elections, uh, there have been uh, big claims that uh, uh, 10, 15 million votes were added the, in the uh, Duma elections in December. So we simply don't know these things, so therefore one shouldn't take it uh, seriously. Mm -hmm. But if you look upon the opinion polls that they produce, uh, Putin's uh, popularity is between 70 and 80 percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so let us pick up this theme of the West and U.S. foreign policy in this new phase. Uh, what do you see as the opportunity here, uh, the contribution that uh, the, the Western economic powers, that U.S. foreign policy might make toward a positive evolution of the Soviet Union, uh, of Russia? Well, there's one fundamental uh, number. Uh, uh, the U.S. today has only 5 percent uh, of uh, uh, Russia's foreign trade, mm -hmm. while uh, the European Union has 52 percent. Mm -hmm. So the U.S. is not very important uh, to Russia today. The U.S. remains important in one regard, uh, and that is uh, a nuclear arms agreement and uh, uh, su such matters. So the relationship between Russia and the U.S. is, you can say, almost entirely strategic and nuclear and uh, nothing else. Of course, other parts of the relationship needs uh, to be developed, uh, more uh, integration. Russia needs to become a member of the WTO, uh, on which is a good way to become a member of the uh, OECD. And uh, uh, also, amazingly, the U.S. has not managed to get uh, the, the agreed um, bilateral investment treaty ratified by Russia. Uh, the U.S. Senate has ratified it, but 38 other countries have managed to ratify it. And then, of course, uh, American companies don't invest directly in uh, Russia uh, from the U.S. They use their foreign subsidiaries because they are covered by much better investment uh, protection treaties uh, than uh, U.S. Uh, uh, companies are. And I think that the big thing that needs to be done today, it is to restore the arms control regime that uh, the current uh, uh, U.S. administration has paid very little attention to, with uh, b uh, abandoning the uh, anti-ballistic uh, missile treaty of uh, 1972. And then recently Russia has uh, responded by suspending the um, uh, treaty on conventional forces uh, in Europe. And uh, there are other treaties that uh, Russia may very well uh, abandon now. And this is, of course, not in the uh, U.S. or uh, any other global interest. Does, does the, does the uh, mixture of Putin authoritarianism, the, the oil wealth, uh, uh, lead to a situation which should give us concern about future uh, Russian foreign policy? Yes and no. It's, of course, not healthy. On the other hand, it's not very aggressive. Russia does nothing to reform its military. Uh, the Kremlin throws uh, more 1970s uh, arms on them, mm -hmm. intercontinental ballistic missile that they can't use, mm -hmm. uh, similar with aircraft carrier and uh, uh, nuclear submarines. This, uh, they stay in a time warp and uh, do things that you did in the 1970s. It has not moved on. We should be worried if uh, Russia undertook serious military reforms, developed ra rapid deployment uh, forces, and uh, uh, developed uh, uh, smart uh, arms. They don't. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so that is actually somewhat reassuring. What we should be concerned about is uh, a massive corruption at the top level today in Russia. Mm -hmm. And if I take one example, uh, the confiscation of Yukos Oil co Company, that was $100 billion that moved to the state. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is uh, divided up in one way or the other uh, to get, uh, by um, the top government uh, officials. So we are seeing a larceny that uh, probably has n never occurred anywhere 
in, uh, in uh, modern times. And this means also that uh, uh, Russia buys politicians. We can see how Gerhard Schröder was bought in, uh, uh, by uh, 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 Gazprom. The Russian mm -hmm. uh, gas company. This is it, the former yeah. uh, chancellor of Germany going to work for the Russian gas yeah. company in Europe. Yeah. Immediately after he had uh, the <laughs> job. And uh, there have been uh, one president and one prime minister of uh, Lithuania who have been ousted uh, because they uh, had taken money from big Russian uh, companies. So when you have uh, uh, a, a country, a government that pursues corruption, as a government policy. That's something that we should be uh, worried about, not by, uh, by Russian arms. That's not what we're using today. How, how do you compare Putin with the other two that we've talked about, Gorbachev and Yeltsin, as a, as a leader? Is, is he a man uh, of, uh, of his time, or is, was it just contingent that, that, uh, that he came to power and rose, or was it inevitable that somebody like that would come to power? I don't think that it was inevitable, and of course he was, he's different in every regard. Uh, both uh, Gorbachev and Yeltsin uh, were men who loved the West, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps too much. They uh, shared Western values and uh, wanted to be as much part of the West as possible, but they didn't know the West very well. They didn't, neither of them spoke foreign languages. Mm. They came from the provinces. They hadn't spent much time abroad. Uh, Putin, uh, on the contrary, speaks foreign languages. He knows the West well, and he doesn't like it. Mm. He's quite contemptuous of it. His uh, view is that the West is decadent and stagnant. He uh, praises China uh, far more. He likes, uh, uh, he's a really kind of growth Darwinist. He likes high growth. He doesn't like weakness. And uh, the West, uh, to him, uh, is uh, uh, just weak. And uh, it's a totally different uh, attitude. Both Gorbachev and Yeltsin were quite open about what they wanted to do. Putin is extremely uh, close. Um, I met uh, uh, Putin three times in the early 1990s at meetings in St. Petersburg, and I don't remember him. He's a person who doesn't leave any impression, who is just discreet, a person who doesn't show his, his cards. And of course, both Gorbachev and Yeltsin wanted to open Russia and to build democracy. Putin says that he wants to build democracy. He speaks in a Jeffersonian way, but he does the opposite. So there's a systematic lying in, uh, in uh, whatever uh, Putin does. One final question. Uh, what, uh, what do you think are the lessons here for other transitions uh, uh, that we will be confronting in other parts of the world? Or is the Russian experience really unique? I, I don't think that it's unique. And uh, the fundamental issue is that if you face a revolutionary situation, then you have to front load the change. Mm -hmm. So, for example, Ukraine after the Orange Revolution should have dissolved the parliament and ha held new parliamentary elections immediately. Uh, then they would have come on a better footing. I think that they will manage even so. But that would have been a better start. So that one should never say, wait a little. If you wait, you lose. That's the fundamental insight about uh, a revolutionary uh, situation. And then which the pillars are, we have, uh, have discussed. They need to be introduced uh, immediately. And uh, one shouldn't wait. And revolutions have a way. Russia is now in the post-revolutionary destabilization, uh, post -revolution stabilization when people are tired of politics and want to make money instead when the economy is coming back. And then it's much easier to restore uh, 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 an authoritarian role, which uh, Putin has done quite successfully.
Dr. Oslin, I want to thank you very much for being here, discussing your book, and I want to show your book one more time because I think uh, we can't do justice to uh, all that you cover in, uh, in this book. So thank you again for being with us today. Thank you very much. My pleasure. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.